Hello and welcome to Chapter 3 of the History of Pondville. With me is Betsy Whitney. Betsy Whitney. And you're our local historian local for Pondville his and the author of this fabulous book, The History of Pondville. And this is a great book and now we're up to Chapter 3. Well, and as we said in our video the last time, Chapter 3 will include several chapters from the book. We're oh, not sure. going to do a chapter no, video for we every... We live long enough to we, do all <laughs> We're coming here anyway, Richard. <laughs> Speaking of that, we're at, the, we're at the Pondville Cemetery, and behind us is the gate uh, with, that says Pondville Cemetery, and that was donated by Charles Sharon, Jr., in 1972, Charlie Sharon was the superintendent of the cemetery, and he had this sign made, and he gifted it to the Pondville Cemetery. In the book, I do go back to the 1940s, and I talk about a uh, Mr. Metcalf, and he had made a sign similar to this that had stood for quite a few years, but okay. had been removed, yeah. And um, we think, we don't know for sure, but we think that Charlie Sharon may have modeled this sign after I think the he did. Mr. I think Metcalf he did. sign. And uh, at the time, I was president of the Cemetery Association, and all of a sudden we had a sign. We, at, which is great. <laughs> we, didn't have a, we didn't have a meeting, we didn't, but he donated it, and it he, fit in the right place, so... So here we are. Yep. Uh, the book contains 19 chapters, and every chapter begins with a vignette in which I admit to the reader what I did not know about my own neighborhood in Pondville. A few times I came down this street, and I saw this sign, and I said, oh, there's a cemetery here? Gee, this is kind of a way out of the way place to have a cemetery. I wonder who's there. Well... There's quite a few folks here there who certainly we know is. now. And yes. we're going to talk about some of them on our little tour of the we cemetery. Are. And Richard, right here where there is a rock, way back in the beginning, this would have been a third entrance to the cemetery. Behind you, Richard, is an entrance, and behind me is an exit. But this has obviously been blocked off and all sure. grassed over. And by the way, the Pondville Cemetery has been nominated for uh, to be on the National Historic Register. But I wanted to read the American Antiquities Act of 1906 that I referred to the last time we were filming. It, it refers to state land, but in my opinion, it refers to private land as well. This is a pri it was a oh, private yes. cemetery. It is a state-owned cemetery now, but it started out as a private entity. That's correct. And here it goes. Here is your country. Do not let anyone take it or its glory away from you. Do not let selfish men or greedy interests Skin your country of its beauty, its history, its architecture, or its romance. The world, the future, and your children shall judge you accordingly as you deal with this sacred trust. And I do believe it is a sacred trust that we are protecting as we preserve Pondville's history. It's true. I think we're living it's true. up to it. We really mm -hmm. are. Well, Nancy and I felt that way when the cemetery was in such disrepair. We took over, and uh, Johnny Forrester's mother, by the way, was our secretary at the time. So uh, we both share a super interest, and of course my folks are buried here, as well as my brother Paul, which is on the other side. And a lot of the folks I grew up with, Buddy Bibber and the Haas family and the Zaccardis, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a local cemetery with a lot of history, well known current names. and older. And now the story of Pondville begins in this cemetery um, <coughs> and I do have some notes in front of me so that I can remember to uh, mention really important names of long ago. 
1761, Jacob Pond, the Jacob Pond, a descendant of Daniel Pond, donated one acre to his friends in which they could bury their family and loved ones. I found the deed about a year ago. I didn't find the original. I found actually a hand copied copy of the original deed. And these are the people who were gifted this acre of land from Jacob Pond, the first Jacob Pond, who would be the son of Ephraim, who was the son of Daniel. Theodore Mann, James Bacon, Daniel Ware, Thomas Brastow, Caleb Day, Ichabod Day, Joseph Everett, Jeffy Everett, and all heirs of these family. This is why Jacob donated this one acre for those friends and families to be laid to rest. In 1909, Virgil Pond donated a vault to this cemetery. Um, actually, the Community Preservation Commission has funded, and it's going on as we speak, money to preserve. Because it was in bad shape. Now, maybe you could tell us about the second vault. Well, I don't know that much about it. I know as a kid we thought skeletons were in there and at Halloween, that was a... And point that one out to us. That was oh, right, right over there. Stuck. Yes. But those were little tiny trees when I, <laughs> when I was here. I think probably when you were kids, you were sitting up on top of that oh, wall. Oh, well, yes. Yes, we did. When this cemetery <clears throat> was nominated for recognition on the National Register, a woman named Martha Lyons came and studied all of the uh, stones, monuments, the, the chapter 13, and I did not call the cemetery chapter, chapter 13 for any <laughs> particular reason, but she has given quite a thorough description of the kinds of markings on graves, decorative work on graves, um, material that stones are made out of. Chapter 13 would be able to give the reader much more detailed information than I could hear. Sure. Okay. You wanna... We have old sections of the cemetery that we can start with, and then we can gravitate towards some new sections. Okay, sounds okay. like a plan. Yes. All right, shall we head on up? Yes, let's go. Okay. In 1987, when this private cemetery was gifted to the town of Norfolk, there was a huge uh, ceremony oh, yes. uh, when that Colorado. day occurred. It was in November of 1987. The DPW is responsible for all the upkeep in the cemetery now. They do a fabulous job. And um, Tom Benedetti and Bob McGee are both, and all of their men are very dedicated to the upkeep of this cemetery. But the flag pole was put up in 1987 in honor of the ceremony that took place here when the cemetery was given to the town, and it has been here since then. In the book, we can see this monument several times. This is a newer a uh, section of Pond family members, though they lived and died in the 1800s. And... Uh, That's quite a monument. Yeah, it's... it's um, and on the sides of each face of the monument, a Pond's name and dates can be clearly seen. And then stones to the left of it are a bit older. It's withstood all those years. It has, yet these, even though these are more recent stones and monuments, they're still quite old. Yeah. But we're going to go back to the okay. very to the old, old section. Yes. You know, one of our we have <clears throat> come up the hill a bit. We have just looked at the pond monument, 
that would be a bit later in time. So Katie has faced the camera toward what was Everett property. Uh -huh. But before Edmund Everett owned it, it was lived in by Captain Abijah Pond, I by see. the way. And in 1847, Edmund Everett donated a section of land that is beyond the stone wall. Uh, part of his property, he donated to make this cemetery larger. And um, so we're going to walk up toward that rustic stone right there that says pond because this is the section of the cemetery that has older stone. So let's go Shall over we? to the monument that says pond and I would like to show you Jacob Pond the second's stone. The second, okay. Because Jacob Pond the <clears throat> second would be our Daniel Pond's grandson uh -huh. and he is the builder of my house on Valley oh, Street, okay. which we have already seen. And one day I was up here looking for the stone. It was kind of a cloudy day like today. And I was, it's really kind of hard to see names on stones. These are so old. <coughs> and the sun came out and it just shone in this section of the cemetery and I was able to find Jacob's stone pretty easily that day. And I thought, this really is a nice place. I thought, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are looking at a beautiful, huge, rustic, natural boulder that was put here. And ponds oh, yeah. Yeah, are all around us. Here we are at Jacob Pond the Second's stone. It's very old. You can see the lichen growing on it. On a sunny day, it's much easier to read the words and the dates. And uh, as we said on our walk over, he's important to me because he built my house. But you can tell that back here is the oldest section yeah, of the cemetery. Is. And there are other prominent old Pondville names, and I had to write these down because I didn't want to miss any. Fairfield, remember we saw Nicholas Fairfield's yep. house. The name Ruggles, Weber, oh, Sharon, yes. that's yep. very recent, Weber and Sharon. Cressy, from Cressy Memorial Church. Messenger, now Messenger. in the book is a piece about Horatio Messenger, who was unfortunately murdered. <sighs> In Pondville, his house would have been up on uh, Dedham Street, Route 1A, um, in the, I, I think, later 1800s. It was a sad thing. I've included the newspaper article. Uh, Gilmore, as in Gilmore Feed and Grain. Oh, yes. Buried yep. in this cemetery. Connors. I am my uh, mom Connors. and dad and now, my brother Paul. Now, who would that be? <laughs> you know, great yes. people. Yes. And there's a wonderful story about your mom. Yes, I in, to see us escape. In the book, and uh, there was some confusion. Oh, yes, it was. Burial confusion, yep, yep. and you and Nancy handled it beautifully. Well, we did what we could. You did a nice she, job. She, was, she and my wife got along really well, so Very it worked well. Out well. She wanted to see her boys skating on Putty's Pond. And your mother went through, you know, she had... Um, World War her II men the in the family. war. Yeah. You were home because you it were was, too young. I was just a young type. You were protecting your neighborhood. Of course, I shot all the Japs and Germans. Absolutely. They, this area was clean. Kept Even Street. the cemetery. Right. Because they tried to sneak in here, you know. <laughs> Kept everybody safe. <laughs> like you said, sitting on top of that uh, crypt over right. there. Oh, yeah, and they came up the hill, but we got them. You were all set. Yeah, my buddies and I. Now the Lynch, the Lynch family oh, yes. yep. are buried in this cemetery. Kozak, and we lost yeah, Paul recently, yes. and he's joined Good the guy. Pondville family. Uh, Forrester, Johnny yep. Forrester's dad, uh, Johnny Rex Forrester, yes. is buried here. Bibber, good. Old, I knew George Bibber. Um, <sighs> Well, I didn't know him, but I used to see a man walking one of a kind. around. One of a kind. He walked around. <laughs> I love this guy. <laughs> I could take the dog out um, at 4 o'clock in the morning. In fact, that's the first time I ever saw George Bibber. 
four in the morning, I was in my front front yard, and this man, very tall, <laughs> yeah. came, I said, uh, come on, Duke, let's go. <laughs> remember, that's fine. And um, as you know, um, someday Whitney will be here, the Whitney family. True, well, so will I. Yes. So. With the day that I came up and located Jacob Stone, I thought, this is a nice cemetery. I wonder if it's still used. I took my cell phone out. I called the DPW. I spoke with Teresa and Amy. I said, can cemetery plots still be bought? They said, oh, sure. I said, reservations for three, please. <laughs> I did have them laughing. I said, I'm sitting right up at the Pondville Cemetery right now, and I think it's the nicest place. And these are things we all have yep. to think about, and I think I'd like to be here. And so Tom Benedetti met me a few days later, and he said, Betsy, this is where you can be. And I said, I think we'll take the, the pieces right next to Paul Connor. So there your you brother go. and I You're will be laughing. Company. We are in good com company. So. And he that, liked you, so that's good. We got no along feuding, so you know, well. No, no feuding. Maybe a little gossiping. I don't know. <laughs> but. Uh, I, I do have a happy attitude of joining my Pondville friends, young and old, and very old, such as the yeah, stones the, yes. that we're standing around. Now, I would like to move over to that section over there. In 1903, um, the Pond Home for the Aged was given a piece of land for their residents only and to this day that is still intact yes it is do you know way back the residents were called inmates isn't that interesting yeah, yeah. um and it says the word inmates it i does. believe on the d yep. so maybe we could take a walk over okay. there we want to exercise our photographer yes our filmmaker director and all the good things she, she does. gives us a head start because we go a little slow she does not because of our age, just because. No! <laughs> no! <laughs> As we look over here, distinctly, this area are all residents of the Pond Home. Uh, I mean, there aren't that many of them. Many folks may have been buried back in home, other states, other back sure. home. Yep. Um, many of the residents did not have family, but they may have had friends um, who had them buried in sure. a different place. But some were certainly welcomed here. And obviously, there's plenty of room for people who live in the Pond Home presently in Rentham. So this continues to be Pond Home. Um, Reserved. Area. For, Reserved yeah. for. Yep. Yes. Now, keeping track of who's where, the first official plan of who is in this cemetery was done in 1845. That isn't the one I did. I that is not that. the one you did, but when you and I were walking up here, you were talking about Yes, when we you took over, mm -hmm. you know, people were asking us questions about this, that, and the other thing, and no one had that we could find had done a, a, a listing of where people were buried. So we mapped it out as best we could. We took the records that were available. Uh, we went from stone to stone and, uh, you know, checked out the names, put them on the map, uh, and recorded basically who we thought was here. Now, we missed a lot of folks, as you had said. You know, when the Indians were here, people didn't want to have monuments yes, because they didn't were afraid of uh, mm -hmm. being uh, dug up and all that. So, but then uh, the Boy Scouts also did a map just recently, within the last you five know, years. in two thousand eight. Eight. John Ward, I believe it was an Eagle Scout project. Yes, it was. And he mapped out very in a very detailed manner where every plot was. And he even listed dates, the epitaph, yep. kind of stone, kind of monument, kind of tomb. So we do have a lot of information now to show yes. us who's Good. where. Right. Okay. Have we finished with the cemetery or is there something else? I like think to we have finished with the cemetery. It's a small one. 
It's a homey one. Yes, it is. It's a very picturesque one, and we're proud of it. It's on. It's, it's on the. True. It's going to be officially on the National Register of Historic Places. Well. So on that note, we'll end. Where are we going to go now? Where would you like to go? Um, I think we thought we'd go down to Everett Street and take a look at the Pondville Railroad okay. area. The and we're going House. to do the Eisner House? Yes, built in 1840. And then we're going to tippy-toe over to the Pondville Hospital? We'll go to the Pondville Hospital, but of course we'll stop on Hill Street and we'll look at the stone abutments that are still there that the railroad bridge oh, used to go oh, okay. over, yep. the stone abutments that, if I have anything to say, will never be taken never. down. Over your... Well, over don't my, say. don't say dead body. <laughs> That's right. Just but we're in the right place. <laughs> and Mary Gould, who lives actually Mary Gould's driveway, was part of the road that led to the Pondville Railroad Station. And last fall, Mary had a sign put up saying Pondville. Looks we'll just to take like, a peek at oh, that. it's a wonderful visual. All right. So let's go. It's a wrap, yes. as they say. Excited. <laughs> I'm trying to learn the lingo. It's a wrap. <laughs> so here we are at the Eisner House. It was built in 1841 by Henry Kirk Pond, and it was lived in by Ponds until in 1931, the Carlson family. You always oh, call yeah, this I know the, the Carlson's, Carlson's yeah. house. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They had a little, uh, they had chickens in front over here. There was a field and they had apples and they grew vegetables and they had the chickens who were on the other side of the street. That now owned. to me, this farm has changed so little. Looking at pictures that it, are in the that's book. That's true, it has. Showing, and it does have a conservation, preservation restriction on it. The uh, fam, the owner of the house has to apply to the Mass, I believe first to the Norfolk Historical Commission, then the Mass Historical Commission. A conservation, uh, preservation restriction restricts the owner from making any changes that will interfere with the integrity of its historical um, status. Well, of course, so, the new yeah. owner. Chris Moore is right. going to stay exactly that way. Yes. He is finding, as you always find on all things, a little bit more than he thought it was going to be when he originally When you it. open up an old house, one thing <laughs> leads to another. You know that better than I anybody. know it because I've done it in our own house. Inside, and I've been inside since all of the renovations had started and walls were removed oh, that yes. had been more recent, the staircase inside a double staircase and one of the staircases had been blocked by a wall when an apartment was made. Yes. Now Ron said that he and his father and mother and his brother. Yes. Did he have sisters did you say? No. No. Just a brother. They lived in this apartment but Chris uh, Moore and his wife have removed that so that beautiful um, it's more like a Victorian staircase. Yeah, and that's Forrester. Yes. Lived in the apartment. Who did? Oh, I didn't yes. know that. Yes, yeah, it's right along the side that she and her sister, Olive, has. Oh. Would be sitting out on the porch. Oh, they were nice, super nice folks. Now, as as history goes, we find things it's true. out. I did not know that, Richard. Well, there you have it. See, and I'm glad I added a something. a lot of um, conversations with old timers in Pondville reveals a lot of history that um, authors need to know about. So yep. thank you. And Buddy Bibber would have been a fountain of knowledge, but he um, just wouldn't, didn't want to do it. He was probably shy. I don't know. I've known him since I was a kid. I'm not as shy. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Maybe you could have talked them into it. I, I might have, yes. Uh, but inside, as you say, having been in here, they really have, of course, there was no central heating. No. No, and the restriction that's on the house does allow for that kind of updating to take place. Is the so. restriction mainly on the in exterior? No, it's exterior and, and interior. certain things inside, huh? It, historical integrity needs to be maintained, but when it comes to kitchens and cooking sure. and so forth um, and, and heating, those allowances oh, are okay. taken into consideration. Yeah. So there is the sign saying Norfolk Historic Commission, 
This house is protected by Historic Preservation Restriction Agreement according to Massachusetts general laws as of November 21st, 2005. I feel very confident that in many years to come, one will travel down Everett Street and see the Eisner Farm looking pretty much as it did in the day. All right, Richard, well, here we are at the driveway of Mary Gould. This driveway was the road that led to the Pondville Railroad Station. Now it stops at Mary Gould's swimming pool. But if we were to continue through the pine trees, we would have seen the Pondville Station building. Now, we're going to show that. Uh, the folks will be able to see a picture of the Pondville yes, Station, which, of course, is no more. But actually, it's not gone for good. Many, many years ago, uh, a man from Walpole purchased that building, and it is now on Route 1 and is the Chinese restaurant yes. right next to the Hess gasoline station. But just a little bit of history about railroading. And the book does give a very detailed, going back to the 1500s of when vehicles that rolled along on tracks began in Germany. In 1820, railroading came to the United States of America. It arrived in Norfolk in the late 40s, early 50s, with the tracks that went through the center of Norfolk. But way out here, no, we didn't see a train until 1890 when the Rentham branch was put in, and it was a branch of the railroad. And believe me, studying railroads is like <laughs> studying a spider web. It is amazingly complicated. But a line uh, came from Walpole Junction out this way and ended up all the way down in Providence, Rhode Island in 1890. Now, the Pondville stop, it stopped at Pondville Hospital and um, went over the railroad bridge that is no more. Well, actually, the one on Hill yeah, Street. Hill Street. First. And then the one that used to be on Pine Street or Route 115 on its journey to Rentham Center and Adams, Adamsdale, Rhode Island, and eventually Providence, Rhode Island. Passenger and Passenger freight. and freight. Now, I, I quite often forget which one ended first. In 1938, passenger service did come to an end. There was an awful lot of competition. And of course, people were starting to buy motor vehicles yes. of their own. So they didn't depend on trains to that extent, to the extent that it had. Um, in, by, incidentally, when we get down to Hill Street, we will see a private house, which was the old freight house. And that was moved from railroad property across the other side of Hill Street in 1935 by Charlie Sharon, who <laughs> enjoyed moving houses. <laughs> he did indeed. And to this day, it is a private home. In the 1960s, uh, the freight service came to an end, and by the late 1970s, tracks and everything were gone. Now, I have always called the abutments stone abutments, uh, trestle blocks. As you know, I refer to the trestle block that I proudly own at the end of my driveway. Yes. I have recently been corrected and told that they are called abutment blocks. Abutment blocks. However. Trestle sounds more romantic. I like the term trestle. I am not sure. I have been also told that a trestle I guess is the structure that goes up and blocks that go on them are called abutment blocks, but they'll always be trestle blocks to me. Very good. And girl. you. And so me. we're gonna <clears throat> stick with trestle blocks. Stick with it. Well you see so you have the privilege of being the author. And I'm so you the can author. call it anything you want. Trestle blocks it is. So we will see the trestle blocks on Hill Street, which are intact. And we have a wonderful surprise 
to show the viewers Mary Gould's less, well, I guess it was about this time last year. So excited, so enthusiastic, rushed over to my house on Valley Street. It was dark. She came rushing into the kitchen and said, get your coat, you're going with me, I have a surprise. I said, okay, and we drove right up Hill Street and she got her headlights on high beam and there up on the old railroad bed was the most beautiful sign that said Pondville just as if it were the Pondville stop of go. long ago. I was thrilled. And every time I drive up and down Hill Street, I see that sign and it thrills me. Good, So me too. That's gonna be a fun thing for everybody to see. The only, I don't remember the uh, passenger train, but my sister-in-law, Mary Lynch Connors, uh, used to ride that. She and her family would walk down here, I imagine, and catch the train. Right to the station, right. So, but I don't remember, I don't remember it as a now, station. Now, you do remember when you were working over at my house, the farm, oh, with yes. your ducks, that would you come up here, or the trains from Boston would the bring food? They would bring, uh, yes, for Charlie, for Charlie Sharon's duck farm. It was hauled in by freight train. And every time that a train would go by, uh, when it was ordered, they had a spur up there, and right. they would run one of the cars over and then leave. Okay. And uh, our job at 25 cents an hour, not mine particularly because I was a skinny little kid, but the men would go up and I'd go with them, and they would unload the bags of grain or whatever they were going to feed the duck. Betty Cottrell lives in, in Walpole, right over the line. Everett Street turns into Summer Street maybe three quarters of a mile yep. past your house. And when Betty's children were little, uh, the train after it left Walpole Junction would start its trip up what everybody called Pondville Hill, pulling its cars and the train would, pr it, their backyard backed right up to the tracks. And the Cottrell kids would come out every day and wave oh, to the yes. guys. Oh yes, we all did that, yeah. And sometimes <clears throat> they would throw them some candy or something. And the whistle. And it, right, or they, yes, yes they want to hear the, the whistle. That was the thrill. And Betty said that sometimes if the train was pulling a particularly heavy load, uh, they would have to stop pretty, pretty much right at Betty's backyard and get a tow train. And the tow train would come from Rhode Island and hook itself up to the train that was coming to the Pondville station and very slowly and slowly get going and pulling it faster and faster. And when Betty was telling me this story, of course, I was thinking of the little engine that could. <laughs> I think I can, I think I can. And she said, you know, it, it, the kids loved it. They would run alongside as the thing got going faster and faster. But now we have seen more and more folks wanting to take trains into cities. Absolutely. Because they don't want to sit there in the traffic that we all know has Well, the population increased. explosion of Norfolk, yeah. when you're talking back to the station days, a few thousand people perhaps, the reason it's increased is the railroad station in Norfolk Center People said, hey, I can move out there. Right. Land at the time was relatively inexpensive. And they would take the train to Boston rather than drive in. Yeah. And that was the big attraction. So <laughs> let's take a little let's, walk down okay. to Hill Street. All right. And we'll look at the stone abutments. And if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to make sure that those trestles, that those stone abutments never get taken down. There you go. Here we are, that's Hill Street, and we're looking at the freight house, what used to be the freight house, and it was over here. Um, and of course, behind me, now we're at the back of Mary uh, Gould's property, and uh, the freight house was moved, as I said, in 1935, and was made into a private residence. Used to be a two-family, but I believe it's yes. a one-family. 
It was two family for a lot of years. Yeah. The Bergmans, who was big in history in Rentham, used oh. to live here. Oh, I didn't know yep, that. Yep, Dick Bergman. Okay. Now, we're going to walk down here and take a right, and I can see right ahead of me the two stone abutments, and the railroad bridge used to go across it. Now, Mary Gould owns the abutment on the right. The abutment on the left is privately owned. I don't know by whom. Oh, and Mary had told me, and I believe it's true, that the railroad line marked when, when it was rezoned. So Richard Connors and all the folks on Everett Street are in residential area. I am in commercial area. That's true. Yeah. Which is, it doesn't of course, make you a why bad I, person. No, though. it doesn't make me a bad person. It makes me a feisty person in that I want to preserve Pondville, the residential part of it, and the commercial part of it. True. So let's take a walk okay. down here. Here's the Pondville sign. And um, as I was telling everybody, when the plumbers who lived at the other end of Hill Street last summer, the plumbers and I climbed up on that side, uh -huh. got up on the railroad bed, and yeah. we walked all the way down past um, the chimney where the coal would have been okay. um, dropped off behind Pondville Hospital. So, so you almost walked into Walpole. It, it, you know, we right really didn't have that much further to go, and we no. would have been in Walpole. But this was in the heat of the summer. Oh, my goodness. We, we walked for... Oh, yeah, that's a long walk. Probably... And we went slowly because we were climbing over trees. Oh, yeah, fallen. unfortunately. We walked for about three hours. Mm. It was quite a trip. Oh, yes. This is where, as I remember, the main track was uh, on that side with a spur that ran off here. And this is where the farm uh, trucks would come from Charlie Sharon's, and the men would load these 100-pound bags of grain and whatever he was feeding his ducks. Now, Richard, all right, so let's walk over and look down. Okay. So if, if the tracks, just double tracks, nothing fancy. Two, two rails. Two rails. If, if the tracks went down here. You can see... I'm trying to figure out exactly where the Pondville station would have been. Was it on this side yes, of the track? Yes, I okay. believe it was. Okay. Again, not from personal experience. No, no, we can but only. Look I at believe pictures. it was on the on this side. Yeah. As was the freight house. One of the problems, and I think you can see why, these old trains, you know, the uh, box cars, had what there was a section that on the by the wheels that you open up and they put oil on the soaked rags and stuff that are in there. Well, every now and then, they'd get a hot box and it would catch fire. That's oh, what it meant. And me. it would spread, as the train went by here, it would spread flames. I mean, this it's dry like you can see it now, pine needles and... You mean it would actually catch fire catch on the fire. ground? Oh my word. So we were continually, because my house is up the way, yes. so we were continually watching to make sure that it didn't start a fire. And sometimes it did, and we would have to go down and put and it And it was up to the homeowner. Oh, my God. Basically, word. because by the, in those days, by the time one of those old fire trucks from North Park Center got over, things were out of gone, control. You know, so. Now, uh, okay, so if we went past the sign, um, I mean the street, you know, the uh, bridge, I, I just have to call it a bridge, would take us to the other stone abutment. Yes. And on we would continue. Now, can we turn and look this way, Katie? It's, this is, you know, this really does show very clearly. And you could still walk through I this did. empty, oh, yep. did you walk that to well, old direction tried, too? Well, I tried, my goal was to get down to Route 115. Boy, I walked quite a ways. It is, I was feeling rather think, yeah. alone, so I never actually no, it is a little made scared. it. I yeah, walked my dog a, there a lot. And so it I, is a bit of a walk. Well, I told the plumbers when they get a chance to come back, we'll take a walk down this sure. way. So uh, the train went right through here, and it must have been pretty quiet around here after the late 60s when it was no more. Yep. But preserved forever in our book, preserved forever on our video.
we, we still are way out there. And when I leave my CPC meetings and my historical commission meetings, everybody goes one way to go home. Yes. And Isn't I always true? go to the Rotary and I begin my way. trip yeah. way out there to Pondville, which we love. This book has changed your life. It no, seriously, has. It, it has. No, it yeah. has. You've put, you've put your whole life on the line for, yeah. the, for Pondville. And I want to personally thank you oh, for my own. No, I and I, I especially want to thank you, my brother. The dedication that you gave to my brother was, I can't express how I feel about it. He I just, know. It was just fabulous. And all of the Pondville, and boy, you've just kept this in people's minds. And for the future, it's just unbelievable. We're now at the Pondville Hospital, which is really a sad sight because it was a historic, beautiful building. Uh, many good things happened here from its beginning, and you wrote about it in your great book. So uh, this is what's left, unfortunately. It's yeah. in pretty much disrepair in every uh, aspect of it. But it was a glorious place, and uh, you certainly covered it well in your book. Well, thank you, Richard, and hello, folks again, uh, as we continue our trip through Pondville. Um, you know, when I was driving in here this morning, I have so much fun doing these videos. We really do enjoy every <laughs> step that we take. And we've had so much laughter and so much. And I remember when you said to me, you have awakened people's um, thoughts and minds to to Pondville, to yes. Old Pondville, and for that I'm so grateful. Today I, I felt so sad. Yes. So sad. I loved writing Chapter 10 about the hospital. And when I moved to Norfolk in 1982, this of course was Southwood. Yes. And I knew that it way back had been called Pondville Hospital, um, and I knew that it was a place that one really did not want to be correct because it um, meant that you had some serious problems with cancer in researching and writing about the Pondville hospital it came so alive and it 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 grew right before me through the pictures the newspaper articles interviews with people who worked here who are still living in Norfolk like including Nancy Connors, yes. your wife, yeah. who worked here. I know she worked in the Bigelow Building, which was built in 1953. That's true. And my chapter starts with an interview with Betty Cottrell, uh, a historian who lives in Walpole, an old-timer, and she did some specialing, which would be private nursing with uh, patients at Pondville Hospital. This was, I just call it, the Dana-Farber of its day. Pondville Hospital itself opened in 1927. Now, I, I've got to go back a little bit. In 1913, 1,200 acres were owned by the Ponds and the Fales. They were sold to Foxborough State Hospital and in 1914, I don't know, do you know all this, uh, this timeline? from your book. From the book, yeah. But Nin I think it's worth noting. Yeah. Oh, 1914, this hospital, it had three buildings that comprised the East Norfolk Hospital, which was a hospital for alcoholics and drug addicts. In 1922, the building changed names. It became... It was called the Holland Vocational School, and it was a retraining, rehabilitation facility for World War I gassed yes. and shell-shocked soldiers. It operated until 1924, so it didn't last terribly long. And Chapter 10 goes into great detail yes, of uh, the whole evolution of Pondville Hospital. 1927, the state of Massachusetts decided to open really the very first 
Cancer Hospital. So in 1927, Pondville Cancer Hospital began. Now the chapter takes the reader through the many years of development. It wasn't a place that was gloom and doom. There was so much hope. There was a lot of success. Betty Cottrell said people were cured. People were released, went home, returned for outpatient therapy. There were many success stories. But what happened to Pondville Hospital, um, it was enlarged and rejuvenated and updated through the years. In 1972, it had a new face, was much bigger. The nurses building, which is over there, still stands. And 1982, it became Southwood Hospital. A few years later, was bought by Caritas, which is owned by the Boston Archdiocese, as it is today. But when area hospitals opened their own cancer wings, there wasn't the need to have folks travel all the way to Pondville. Every hospital, it seemed, in the area had its own cancer unit. By 1999, the client ship was greatly reduced. The state, unfortunately, was losing money on this facility. Uh, so the doors essentially were closed. Um, the buildings were dormant, but still intact, still looking pretty good yep. until 2003. And then the doors really were closed, windows boarded up. And it wasn't until I was practically ready to put the book to press that Norma Shrewhan from the Norfolk Senior Center, yeah. I don't know what the official that's, title that's is, good. Council, told me that um, the Senior Center was asked if it would like some furniture, kitchen supplies from Southwood, and indeed they did. We certainly so did. So you were involved in oh, that. Oh, yes. You brought your own, you had to get your own trucks. We took everything that wasn't nailed down. And, and there are many utensils in the kitchen. Um, Norma finally realized that I was uh, hinting about how many hundreds of plates there were that came from Pondville Hospital, which was in my book, Chapter 10. And I love to collect artifacts yes, from you do. the various sites in Pondville. And um, oh, this plate that I'm using, that came from Pondville Hospital? Oh, that's amazing. You have so many of them. You must be thrilled. And she said, Betsy, would you like one? <laughs> yes, I surprise, would. Surprise, surprise. Thank you for thinking of me. <laughs> and I love my plate from Pondville. Good. So that is a very long-winded sort of capsule um, in time of what has happened. Well, mm -hmm. you you couldn't start on the history of Pondville without, without going through all of that. All and, that. And that gives the viewer an opportunity to, you know, go see your book and fill in with the details. That's yeah. a, It's sad. Oh. My, I have some sad memories. I have some good memories here yeah. because my brothers worked here um, when we lived over on, on Everett Street where I live now. And this is where we passed through to go to Route 1A to catch our school bus to Walpole. Oh, the very famous school the very buses that school, you were on. School bus. Yes. So, and in the days of, uh, you know, like 10, 12 years old, roamed all through here. There were buildings way up back on the hill, oh. and that's where the residents stayed. Dr. Parker, who was the uh, director of this hospital when I was a kid, mm -hmm. lived on the far end in his own private home. The others were apartments for people who worked here because, as you said, it's such a distance yes. for people to come that in order to uh, have a place for them to stay so the transportation wasn't like it is today where everybody has a car, uh, they stayed in those residences. They're all gone now. They've been used to uh, uh, test our fire equipment, uh, everything that you can think of, and then they tore them down. Now, Richard, I want to interject. Go ahead, sure. Pondville Hospital was a teaching hospital. Yes, it was. Just like Tufts Medical Center, Absolutely. Mass General, New England Medical Center, a New England Baptist, um, 
children's hospital. They're all teaching hospitals. And doctors from far and wide came here. It was a state-of-the-art, wonderful place. It really was. I have been here many times, and I feel like I have made friends with this site. It's very hard for me to see this place looking dead because it's so alive. And in this book, this place comes to life. It does. I just wanted to back yes. up what you said about uh, people coming here, doctors, famed doctors came here. My wife started working for the state in the laboratories up there and worked with a doctor from Harvard. And he was doing research on cancer. And she worked a lot hand in glove with him. And finally he said, I want to hire you from Harvard. So they had a whole Harvard set up here to uh, do research, and they did a lot of good things here, just like you said. It, so it, Nancy was quite proud of this hospital, by the way. They had a great time here, by the way. The recreation, there was a ball field, they had bowling teams. I mean, this was not the dumpy place no, that it, it looks it really like now. No, and it really was a family, and sure. it's referred to in some of the publications yep. that I found for the book um, as a family. And Eisner worked here. And, you Fancy. know... As I have met Pondville friends from from back in time, Mary Kozak, I believe, yep. worked here. Paul Kozak worked Just here. Just about everybody, you know, um, the old timers worked here at one time or another. And one of the Chauncey Eisner. Chauncey was Chauncey started out as a cook here, but then, as you know, he had problems with his eyes. There was a little problem with salt and sugar, and so he went to work on the grounds. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I still run into folks who have read my book, and they say, uh, Georgia Jones. Yep. I worked at Pondville Hospital. Oh, it was, this well, that was. was why a lot of folks moved into this area. Right. They worked at the prison. They worked here. Some of them worked at the Retham State School. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was a draw. So I think what we need to do is remember that all... Up here were the original buildings that are gone. The walls, at some point, walls were actually part of the administration building. They're still there. Well, it was, yes, that's true. The administration building was about in the center, yeah. maybe a little off. But then there were beds, you know, uh, uh, what do you call them, wards right. on uh, both sides. Uh, it was, you're going to show the picture, but it was, it was an attractive building. It, and now the Plummer family who lived on Hill Street, last summer we walked way up behind there sure. and could see a few picnic tables that were still there, oh, yes. a stone fireplace, and it a was center quite, of a lot of, uh, it was activity. a booming metropolis. It but was. let's take a little walk around and take a visual trip as Sounds well. Sounds like a good plan. It's, it's sad. This is what... We're going to capture it in film, it's captured in words, it's captured in my book in pictures of then, then. I love those then pictures. <laughs> and now, and there are hopes for the future. And let's just sort of head right down. Okay. I love the domed arches. I think yes. that's a signature of this hospital. The Bigelow Building, 1953. Sounds right, Came yes. first. That's true. This, this section here, which was with the reception, reception building, reception area. Okay, the reception area. And then the larger building had doctors' offices, uh, patient, inpatient patients type on the uh, and yeah. Would, and I yes. believe that's the five-floor building. Yes. It yes. Is. Okay. And patients that would come for appointments with doctors and so on. Okay. Would go on the other side. There's an entrance to where they would go. Uh, to go in for, say, daily treatment, whatever it might be. Richard noted just a few moments ago that the smokestack, can, yeah. you, can you see the smoke? Well, it's in the trees. Is it sort of in the trees? Yeah. This a hospital was originally heated by coal. It was indeed, and the, yeah. the train that we have talked about right. had a spur that would come over, and they would dump the coal into these big cement areas, and then the firemen for the uh, burners, boilers, would go out, fill up the wheelbarrow, come in. Well, and when the plumbers and I last summer walked down the tracks, we saw that spur. A spur is yep. an extension um, 
off of the main track. Right. We could see the tracks right there, going right up to where the coal bins lay. And, you know, you've talked about Herbie Hoxley. His yes. dad was the fireman who went that's and right. got the coal. And I and think that's in the book, yes. too. Yep. Um, there's another Pawnville name family yep. who worked at this hospital. As you can see, the building has really come apart with oh, the bricks yeah. falling down. That portico down there was where you would park over here. You would go in there for day surgery or whatever it might be. And they would practice not just cancer or anything. It was all kinds. All kinds. They had doctors uh, in there that would treat you so for sore throat. So this was outpatient only? Yes. Okay, okay. And uh, some of the patients were in these various uh, rooms that you see up top. Behind there is the cooling system and the... Uh, the if we were to walk all yeah. the way down and go, and go to the around left, the back, you'd get to see... Where the smokestack was. you get to see even a worse carnage, so we yeah. don't want to go back no, there. No, we're not going to Over that. there, behind yeah. those beautiful trees, is what they call the sewer bin. All right. And that's how they disposed... They didn't have uh, septic facilities, septic tanks. Right. They're... I think there's like four or five of them, and it's done by sand. And I thought that it was not healthy to be living like where I live because there may be some with cancer and all of that sort of thing because I don't know anything about medicine. I depend on my wife. Mm -hmm. uh, but I went to the Board of Health, and they say that's the best possible method they could have used. Yes. Medical Toxic. waste was dumped over here. Okay. And that's where one of the spots where the hazardous waste was dumped. Okay. And that's one of the problems they're having. Yeah. Of course. Adding to the difficulty of selling this site is the cleanup that's involved. Yes. And that's mighty expensive. I was telling so, Katie that yeah. our legislature, in their wisdom, voted to fund the money to come here to clean it up and the state would pay for it because it's their waste. Yeah. However, what they forgot to do is fund it. They voted oh, they to do it. they made a plan, but <laughs> they voted, forgot they to voted put the to money do it, aside. But they just never put the money in. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's not untypical, but it, that's what happened here. Otherwise, it would have been cleaned up and we wouldn't be talking about it. So we're going to say goodbye to Pondville Hospital. We're going to say goodbye to Pondville yep. Hospital. It's a shame, but I think... I know, but I drive by it about five certain, times a day. Well, the good thing about it is, and I don't want to blow your horn, but the good thing is what you've written in here will keep forever. it in the memory forever. forever. People that worked here, yep. people that are coming later on, people that drive in here and say, well, what was this? What was it's that? there in yep. the book. Well, we've come to your home, which is where we oh. started this whole tour of Pondville. And again, I know I've said it a zillion times, only because of your talent and perseverance has this book been able to come and save Pondville in the minds oh, and memories of a lot of folks. That is the best thing I could ever hear, Richard, and we have had a wonderful time. We have. And Nancy had such a wonderful comment about Pondville is now what she always knew it would be, a pot of gold. That's true. And she and you have contributed so much to this entire project. Am I blushing? And Paul. Yes. And I But it took someone who didn't grow up here to put <laughs> it all together. No, no, I'm, I'm still embarrassed about that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All those years that I lived here, yeah. I, never, I wouldn't have had the talent, number one, and the perseverance that you had to put this book together. Well, and thank you. Thank you so much. It all Can I shake your hand? Yeah, the hand that, that I... Hand. Let's shake the other hand. You did a great job. And thank we, you. A couple of things I just wanted to say. Right. We're not done. I know. We've got some future work ahead, but we'll let you know about that. I think we've gone as far as we should go up to this point. Otherwise, we'll freeze to death. No, <laughs> the uh, taping of this has been a lot of fun. It it's, has. You know, sometimes you look forward to doing something like this and you say, mm. but 
this has just worked out well. Of course, you and I have known each other. For years. For years. Katie was late on the scene, but what an addition to our crew. There isn't anything <clears throat> Katie can't do. And if, if we needed a voiceover, a picture, something rearranged, something cut Absolutely. and pasted, and that's all part of the editing process. She's done a great job. Behind the scenes, it involves a lot of work and so much skill. So it goes to show you that everybody can work together and well, you see, come up with a great... Katie had the right attitude. Mm -hmm. It's just like you had the right attitude in writing the book. It was, and that's what carried through. If she was just a camera person and said, okay, I took the pictures, I'll yeah. run them, and that, that was it. That's not the case. And she treats the seniors the same way, by the way. So we do owe her a debt of gratitude. But she and I both have learned a lot working with you. Oh, thank you. Is, and Katie is shaking her head. Yes. Yes. And it's been so much fun and very So rewarding. we'll be back to you when the weather turns, and we'll decide on another chapter or two. We'll see how it all goes. We will. And we wish you a very good winter, and we'll see you in the spring and, and summer. And the very best from Pondville. We're always here, and we will always be here. Okay. Thank you. We're going to ask Katie one last favor. Okay. At the end, if she could put on the screen where to buy the book, oh, sure. the phone number, sure. and if people have input yes. uh, about Pondville, you're willing to take the call. Oh, sure. So if we, we just keep her working. Keep she'll me never, working. She'll never get laid off, man. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you.